and dial your NBC station. Say, that sounds dreamy. It's Jimmy Dorsey and the fabulous Dorsey Orchestra featured all this week on NBC Bandstand, along with MC Burt Parks and the top singing star in person every day. NBC Bandstand, that's the way to start the day. And now stay tuned for Sleep No More on NBC. This is Nelson Olmsted. Sleep No More. Sleep No More. Turn down the lights, sink back in your chair, and don't look into the shadows. In the shadows, there may be moving things. Tonight, it may be, you will sleep no more. Good evening. This is Ben Grauer introducing tonight's tale of terror, told by Nelson Olmsted on the National Broadcasting Company's presentation of Sleep No More. The story of terror can be as simple as a sheeted ghost rattling chains. It can be a complex and hidden world of horror, lurking in such unholy dimensions as only the dead and the moonstruck can glimpse. Or it can be those terrible fathomless shadows which lie buried deep in the primitive mind of civilized man. And for this evening, well, Nelson Olmsted, tell us about this evening's story. Once again, Ben, we have two stories tonight. The Death of Olivier Bicay by Emile Zola and Fishhead by Irvin S. Cobb. Fishhead is one of those tales that always makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. It's the fantastic story of a human monstrosity who was the veritable embodiment of a nightmare. It sounds promising. So let Nelson Olmsted tell us about the man called Fishhead. It goes past the powers of my pen to try to describe Real Foot Lake for you so that you, hearing this, will get the picture of it in your mind as I have it in mine. It's the largest lake south of Ohio, lying mostly in Tennessee, but extending up across what is now the Kentucky line. It is, and always has been, a lake of mystery. In places it is bottomless. Other places, the skeletons of the cypress trees that went down when the earth sank still stand upright so that if the sun shines from the right quarter and the water is less muddy than common, a man, peering face downward into its depths, sees below him the bare top limbs upstretching like drowned men's fingers, all coated with the mud of years and bandaged with pennons of green lake slime. In still other places, the lake is shallow for long stretches, no deeper than breast high to a man, but dangerous because of the weed growths and the sunken drifts which entangle a swimmer's limbs. Its banks are mainly mud. Its waters are muddied too, being a rich coffee color in the spring and a copperish yellow in the summer. And the trees along its shore are mud colored clear up to their lower limbs after the spring floods when the dried sediment covers their trunks with a thick, scrofulous-looking coat. There are stretches of unbroken woodland around it, and slashes where the cypress trees rise countlessly like headstones for the dead snags that rot in the soft ooze. There are long, dismal flats, where in the spring the clotted frog spawn cling like patches of white mucus among the weed stalks, and at night the turtles crawl out to lay clutches of perfectly round white eggs with tough rubbery shells in the sand. There are bayous leading off the nowhere and sloughs that wind aimlessly like great blind worms, finally to join the big river that rolls a few miles to the westward. Real Foot Lake is a wonderful place for fish, bass and crappie and perch and the snotted buffalo fish. How these edible sorts live to spawn and how their spawn in turn live to spawn again is a marvel. 
seeing how many of the big fish-eating cannibal fish there are in Rio Foot. Here, bigger than anywhere else, you find the gar fish, all bones and appetite and horny plates with a snout like an alligator, the nearest link, naturalists say, between the animal life of today and the animal life of the reptilian period. But the biggest of them all are the catfish. These are monstrous creatures, these catfish of real foot, scaleless, slick things with corpsey dead eyes and poisonous fins like javelins, and huge whiskers dangling from the sides of their cavernous heads. Six and seven feet long they grow to be, and weigh 200 pounds or more. And they have mouths wide enough to take in a man's foot or a man's fist, and strong enough to break any hook save the strongest, and greedy enough to eat anything, living or dead or putrid, that the horny jaws can master. Oh, but they are wicked things, and they tell wicked tales of them down there. They call them man-eaters, and compare them in certain of their habits to sharks. Fishhead was a piece of this setting. He fitted into it as an acorn fits its cup. All his life, he had lived on real foot, always in the one place at the mouth of a certain slough. He'd been born there of a Negro father and a half-breed Indian mother, both of them now dead. And the story was that before his birth, his mother was frightened by one of the big fish so that the child came into the world most hideously marked. Anyhow, Fishhead was a human monstrosity the veritable embodiment of a nightmare. He had the short, stocky, sinewy body of a man, but his face was as near to being the face of a great fish as any face could be, and yet retained some trace of human aspect. His skull sloped back so abruptly that he could hardly be said to have a forehead at all. His chin slanted off right into nothing. His eyes were small and round with shallow, glazed, pale yellow pupils, and they were set wide apart in his head and they were unwinking and staring like a fish's eyes. His nose was no more than a pair of tiny slits in the middle of a yellow mask. His mouth was the worst of all. It was the awful mouth of a catfish, lipless and almost inconceivably wide, stretching from side to side. Also, when Fishhead became a man grown, his likeness to a fish increased for the hair upon his face grew out into tightly kinked slender pendants that dropped down either side of the mouth like the beards of a fish. If he had any other name than Fishhead, none excepting himself knew it. As Fishhead he was known, and as Fishhead he answered. Mainly he kept to himself with no kith nor kin, nor even a friend, shunning his kind and shunned by them. His cabin stood just below the state line, where the mud slough runs into the lake. It was a shack of logs, the only human habitation for four miles up or down. If the real footers shunned Fishhead by day, they feared him by night and avoided him as a plague, dreading even the chance of a casual meeting. For there were ugly stories about Fishhead, stories which all the Negroes and some of the whites believed. They said that a cry, which had been heard just before dusk and just after skittering across the darkened waters, was his calling cry to the big catfish. And at his bidding, they came trooping in and that in their company he swam in the lake on the moonlit night, sporting with them, diving with them, even feeding with them on what manner of unclean things they fed. The cry had been heard many times, that much was certain. Also, that the big fish were noticeably thick at the mouth of Fishhead Slough. No native real footer, white or black, would willingly wet an arm or a leg there. Here Fishhead had lived, and here he was going to die. The Baxters were going to kill him. And this day in late summer was to be the time of the killing. The two Baxters, Jake and Joel, were coming in their dugout to do it. This murder had been a long time in the making. The Baxters had to brew their hate over a slow fire for months before it reached the pitch of action. They were poor whites, poor in everything, repute and worldly goods and standing a pair of fever-ridden squatters who lived on whiskey and tobacco when they could get it and on fish and cornbread when they couldn't. The feud itself was of month standing. Meeting Fishhead one day in the spring, the brothers had accused him wantonly and without proof 
of running their trout line and stripping it of the hooked catch, an unforgivable sin among the water dwellers and shanty boaters of the South. Seeing that he bore this accusation in silence, only eyeing them steadfastly, they had been emboldened then to slap his face, whereupon he turned and gave them both the beating of their lives. They swore that they would get him. There'd been no hitch or mishap. No one had been abroad in the late afternoon to mark their movements. And in a little while, fish had ought to be due. Jake's woodsman's eye followed the downward swing of the sun speculatively. The shadows thrown shoreward lengthened and slithered on the small ripples. The small noises of the day died out. The small noises of the coming night began to multiply. The green-bodied flies went away, and big mosquitoes with speckled gray legs came to take their place. The sleepy lake sucked at the mud banks with small, mouthing sounds, as though it found the taste of the raw mud agreeable. Bull bats began to flitter back and forth above the tops of the trees. A pudgy muskrat, swimming with head up, was moved to slide off briskly as he met a cotton-mouthed moccasin snake, so fat and swollen with summer poison that it looked almost like a legless lizard as it moved along the surface of the water in a series of slow, torpid S's. Directly above the head of either of the waiting assassins, a compact little swarm of midges hung, holding to a sort of kite-shaped formation. But the two brothers in their dugout gave heed to nothing except the one thing upon which their hearts were set and their nerves tensed. Joel gently shoved the gun barrels across the log, cuddling the stock to his shoulder and slipping two fingers caressingly back and forth upon the triggers. Jake held the narrow dugout steady by a grip upon a fox grape tendril. A little wait, and then the finish came. Fish had emerged from the cabin door and came down the narrow footpath to the water and out upon the water on his log. He stood there erect, his chest filling, his chinless face lifted up, and something of mastership and dominion in his poise. And then his eye caught what another's eyes might have missed, the round twin ends of the gun barrels, the fixed gleam of Joel's eyes aimed at him through the green tracery. In that swift passage of time, too swift to be measured by seconds, realization flashed all through him, and he threw back his head still higher and opened wide his shapeless trap of a mouth, and out across the lake, he sent skittering and rolling his cry. And in his cry was the laugh of a loon and the croaking bellow of a frog and the bay of a hound, all the compounded night noises of the lake. And in it, too, was a farewell and a defiance and an appeal. The heavy roar of the duck gun came. At 20 yards, the double charge tore the throat out of him. He came down face forward upon the log, and then the blood came out of his mouth. And fish head, in death still as much fish as man, slid, flopping headfirst off the end of the log and sank face downward slowly, his limbs all extended out. One after another, a string of big bubbles came up to burst in the middle of a widening, ready stain on the coffee-colored water. The brothers watched this, held by the horror of the thing they had done, and the cranky dugout, having been tipped far over by the recoil of the gun, took water steadily across its gunwale. And now there was a sudden stroke from below upon its careening bottom, and it went over, and they were in the lake. But the shore was only 20 feet away, the trunk of the uprooted tree only five. Joel, still holding fast to his shotgun, made for the log, gaining it with one stroke. He threw his free arm over it and clung there, treading water as he shook his eyes free. Something gripped him. Some great sinewy, unseen thing gripped him fast by the thigh, crushing down in his flesh. He uttered no cry, but his eyes popped out and his mouth set in a square shape of agony and his fingers gripped into the bark of the tree like grapples. He was pulled down and down by steady jerks, not rapidly, but steadily, so steadily. And as he went, his fingernails tore four little white strips in the tree bark. His mouth went under. Next, his popping eyes, then his erect hair, and finally his clawing, clutching hand. And that was the end of him. Jake's fate was harder still, for he lived longer, long enough to see Joel's finish. He saw it through the water that ran down his face, and with a great surge of his whole body, he literally flung himself across the log and jerked his legs up high into the air to save them. He flung himself too far, though, for his face and chest hit the water on the far side. And out of this water rose the head of a great fish, 
with the lake slime of years on its flat black head, its whiskers bristling, its corpsey eyes alight, its horny jaws closed and clamped in front of Jake's flannel shirt. His hand struck out wildly and was speared on a poisonous pin. And unlike Joel, he went out of sight with a great yell and a whirling and churning of the water that made the corn stalk circle in the edges of the small whirlpool. But the whirlpool soon thinned away into the widening rings of ripples. And the corn stalks quit circling and became still again. And only the multiplying night noises sounded about the mouth of the slough. <laughs> The bodies of all three came ashore on the same day, near the same place. Except for the gaping gunshot wound where the neck met the chest, Fishhead's body was unmarked. But the bodies of the two Baxters were so marred and mauled that the real footers buried them together on the bank without ever knowing which might be Jake and which might be Joel. This has been Irvin S. Cobb's short story, Fishhead, as told by Nelson Armstead. Now, Mr. Armstead, about the second story? Well, have you ever experienced the terrifying thought that someday you might, by some accident, be buried alive, abandoned, given up as dead? The famous Frenchman, Emile Zola, must have had such a thought, for he wrote the weird tale we'll hear now, The Death of Olivier Bicaille. It was on a Saturday at six o'clock in the morning that I died. My poor wife had been bending over a trunk where she was looking for some linen. When she straightened up and saw my staring eyes, my rigid body, my chest quiet, she ran to me thinking I had fainted. She pressed my hands and looked into my face, and then a terror took hold of her, and she cried, Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, he's dead. I heard everything, but the sounds were faint and seemed to come from a distance. Only my left eye still perceived a confused light, a whitish glimmer, in which the objects of the room melted together. My right eye was completely paralyzed. This swoon, which overtook my entire body like a thunderbolt, prostrated me completely. My will was dead, not a fiber of my nerves obeyed me. Only within my impotent, inert frame, thought remained. Slow, languid, but perfectly clear. Could this then be death? Even as a child, I was afraid of death. I had always believed I wouldn't live and that they would soon bury me. And this thought of the soil horrified me. I could never accustom myself to it, even though it haunted me constantly. And in growing up, I had always retained this fixed idea and this fear. All this was passing through my mind while my dear Marguerite continued to weep beside me. It troubled me, not knowing how to calm her, not being able to tell her that I wasn't suffering. If death was nothing but this swoon of the flesh, then indeed I was wrong to have feared it so. It was actually a feeling of well-being, a great repose, in which worry and trouble were left behind. Poor Marguerite. Now she was alone. She kissed my hands and cried out repeatedly, Olivier, answer me, answer me. Oh, he is dead. But I couldn't possibly be dead. I would wake up soon, surely. Yes, presently I would lean over and take Marguerite in my arms. Presently, when she came to me again, I would murmur very low so as not to frighten her while I kissed her cheek. I'm only sleeping, my dearest. Don't you see that I'm alive and that I love you? The next moment, I heard a voice which I recognized. It was that of the old lady, Madame Gabin, who lived in the same floor. I felt her approaching. She looked at me, touched me, and then murmured gently, Oh, my poor child, my poor child. Madame Gabin took possession of the situation and quieted Marguerite as much as she could. And suddenly the misty light that I could still observe with my left eye disappeared. Madame Gabin had just closed my eyes, though I had not felt the touch of her finger on my eyelid. When I at last understood, a chill began to creep down my backbone. Then Madame Gabin spoke. You know, my dear, we must think about formalities. The announcement to the city hall and all the details of the funeral. You're in no state to think about that now, and I don't want to leave you alone. But if you will permit me, I'm going to see if Monsieur Simonot is at home. 
Well, Marguerite didn't answer. However, I wished that she would have refused the services of the Simono. I had seen him three or four times during my short sickness. He was a big fellow, very handsome, very strong. I detested him, perhaps because of his manly appearance. The evening before he had come in and it had pained me to see him sitting next to Marguerite. She appeared so pretty, so white beside him. Simono came, murmured his sympathy, and left to make arrangements. As the room became silent again, I asked myself whether this nightmare would last very long. I must be alive, for I sensed everything that was going on. I tried to imagine exactly what had happened to me. It must be one of those strokes of catalepsy about which I had heard. When I was very young, I had experienced trance-like fits which lasted several hours. Evidently, it was a crisis of this sort which now made my body rigid, as though life had left it, in which deceived everyone around me. But my heart would begin beating again. Blood would course through my veins once more. I would awaken, and I would console Marguerite. In reasoning thus, I found some peace for myself. Hours passed. Simono reappeared, whispering to Madame Gabin that the funeral was set for 11 o'clock the next day, and that the doctor for the dead would soon come. The doctor for the dead. He would do what would be necessary to revive me. I waited for him with great impatience. He came that night, not even excusing himself for being so late. He lost no time. I gathered he was tired, impatient, and in a hurry. Did he touch my hand? Did he listen for my heartbeat? I don't know. But it seemed to me that he looked at me with a great indifference. A moment later, he was gone. It was my life that had gone. Cries and tears and oaths stifled me, lacerated my convulsed throat, but no sound escaped. So this was the end. I was condemned. My last hope disappeared with this man. If I didn't awaken before 11 o'clock the next day, I would be buried alive. This thought was so horrible that I lost consciousness. I awoke when they placed me in the coffin and nailed the top in place. I had the sensation of riding on a rolling sea while they carried me out. Later, they took me out of the hearse. The priest mumbled some Latin phrases. Many feet moved about for a few minutes, and then suddenly I felt myself sinking. Ropes rubbed against the sides of the coffin, sounding like the strings of a double bass file. This was the end. A double concussion, violent and loud as a cannon, burst upon me near the left side of my head as the first shovelfuls of dirt hit the coffin. A second impact took place near my feet. Then another even greater than the last struck me through the center. So violent was it that I thought the coffin would break in two, and I fainted. How long did I remain thus? I could not say. In nothingness of whole eternity in a single second have the same duration. But little by little, confusedly, the consciousness of being came back to me. I tried to rise and struck my head violently. Was I finally coming out of the catalepsy which had for so many hours given me the appearance of one dead? Well, yes, I, I could move. A last test remained to be made. I opened my mouth and screamed, Marguerite! My voice inside the closed box took on such a hollow sound that it frightened me. Almighty God, was it true? I was able to move. I was able to cry out loud that I was alive. And my voice would never be heard. I was completely surrounded, stifled inside the earth. Finally, in a fit of hopeless anger, I kicked both feet out terrifically and was amazed to hear part of the wood give way. Another sturdy kick, and my feet shot out into an open space. Next to me was a recently dug open grave just a small partition of earth to dig through in order to roll out into this empty space. Oh, God be praised. I was saved. Oh, but it was good to live. My first thought was to find Marguerite. But as I reached the road, a weakness came over me, and I fell forward heavily. <laughs> For three weeks, I was unconscious. When I finally came to my senses, I found myself in a strange room. A man was there taking care of me. 
He told me simply that one morning he found me on Montparnasse Boulevard and had taken me to his home. He was an old doctor who'd given up his practice. When I began to thank him, he cut me short by saying the case had appeared interesting to him and that he wanted to study it. Further than this, I learned nothing. I regained strength slowly. But one June morning, I obtained permission to take a short walk and immediately set out to go to my old lodging. With difficulty, I reached it. And then a childish fear agitated me. If I presented myself suddenly this way to Marguerite, the shock might kill her. The best thing would be to see first the old neighbor, Madame Gabin. I decided to enter a little restaurant downstairs. I must have been unrecognizable. My beard had grown during my illness, and my face had become very thin. Then I heard two women of the house gossiping. They were talking about Marguerite. One was asking if she had decided as yet, and the other answered that she thought so. She said, Yes, Monsieur Simonot has been kind to her. He's wound up his father's affairs, and he has a lot of money, and he's offered to take her to the country with him to live with one of his aunts who wants a companion. It will certainly end in marriage. Hmm. Well, <coughs> after all, said the other woman, the husband was no match for Monsieur Simonot. I never liked him, always whining and not a penny. No, he was no husband for a woman with blood in her veins. When I again found myself in the street, I walked slowly and with difficulty. I didn't suffer much, however. I even smiled when I saw my shadow in the sun. Certainly, I was very thin. It was a singular idea for me to marry Marguerite. And I recall how tired she was of her home before she married me. Oh, the dear creature was always so good. But I'd never been her lover. It was a brother whom she mourned. Why should I disturb her life again? A dead man is not jealous. She could really be happy now. I would certainly not make the cruel mistake of coming to life. Well, since that time, I've traveled much and have lived in many lands. I'm a commonplace man who has worked and eaten like everyone else. Death no longer terrifies me. But it seems that he doesn't want me now, that I have no reason to live. And I'm afraid he may have forgotten me. can turn up the lights now. You can look around you. Nobody is there, really. Everything is all right. Isn't it? Well, Nelson Olmstead, uh, what's on the story list for next week? Two quite different stories, Ben. The first, The Horsehair Trunk by Dave Grubb is a story of revenge calculated to chill your spine. The second, A Friend to Alexander, is by James Thurber, who is noted principally for his humorous writings. Although I doubt if you'll find anything to laugh at in this little gem. And if you meet me here next week, I'll prove it. You've been listening to Sleep No More, an NBC Radio Network production directed by Kenneth McGregor. Mr. Olmsted's albums are recorded exclusively for Vanguard Records. Until next week, when Nelson Olmsted will again be here in person, this is Ben Grower, bidding you good night. <laughs>